Welcome to Startup Lehigh Valley Virtual. This is the second annual pitch competition for entrepreneurs and innovators in and around the Lehigh Valley, presented by Factory and Penn State Lehigh Valley Launchbox. At Factory, we help small companies become big brands. We partnered with Launchbox to bring local entrepreneurs, business leaders, investors, industry experts, merchants, higher education representatives, students, and community members together in one room, this year a virtual one, in order to showcase the innovation that is already happening in our local community. You are about to watch 10 Lehigh Valley entrepreneurs each present a two minute quick pitch of their business idea or product. Afterwards, our judges will have one minute to ask questions. You will then be invited to vote for your favorite pitch. The judges will take your input into account when awarding the final prizes. You are encouraged to interact via the chat throughout their presentations, and there are even prizes to be awarded for the most engaged audience members. Our grand prize winner will take home $3,500 to help the growth of their business. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Richard Thompson. I'm the founder and managing partner over at Factory, over at Innovation Scale-Up Center. Uh, that we handle food, beverage, pet, uh, and we're located in South Bethlehem. Um, welcome to the second annual uh, Lehigh Valley Startup, uh, Startup Lehigh Valley, I should say. But the uh, Startup Lehigh Valley, uh, this year we're doing it uh, virtual, uh, because obviously because of the pandemic, we really can't get together in the room with everybody this year. So we're doing this um, uh, virtual this year. So hang on tight. We had a problem with Facebook getting started. So if you were on Facebook, you should go to YouTube Live because YouTube is, uh, is what's uh, streaming live for us right now. People ask me all the time uh, what it means to be an entrepreneur, right? Is that I've been an entrepreneur my whole life, so I kind of, it takes one to know one, and I kind of know. And I know you too probably have a little bit of entrepreneurial in you because everybody has a good idea, good thought. Uh, even our, one of our judges this year is uh, uh, one of the winners from last year, Matt. Uh, you'll meet him in a second. Um, so everybody has an idea or at school or at work, somebody asking them like, is this a good idea? So you all have good ideas. It's about executing those ideas. So first of all is that is that um, you have to take risk. You gotta understand about risk. You gotta work hard. You gotta make mistakes. A lot of mistakes, right? Because you know, if you don't make a mistake, you're never gonna get it right. Uh, you gotta raise cash. You gotta have that capital to pay all your people. You hire people, right? You have lots of responsibilities. And you have to deal with stress, right? There's a lot of stress uh, being an entrepreneur, uh, meet, meeting the budget uh, every day. Um, so, but now there's even more stress for 10 entrepreneurs because they're going to have to pitch live uh, to all of you out there in virtual land. So um, live is coming up, but let me tell you first about some of the prizes so that we're all on the same page about the prizes. Um, our partner, uh, Penn State, uh, Lehigh Valley uh, Launchbox, uh, is awarding the cash prizes, but the money is not like, here's your check, you know, thank you, and you go to Hawaii. No, that doesn't work that way. What it works uh, is that is that they will be paying out the uh, money to the uh, winners uh, based on uh, invoices, uh, based on qualifying invoices, I should say, that move your business forward, that help you grow your business um, as you build your business, right? And uh, Lehigh Valley, um, Penn, Penn State Lehigh Valley will be the ones that um, uh, judge what invoices get paid based on how it helps your business move forward. So just wanna be clear on that. Uh, Penn State, uh, uh, Penn State uh, Lehigh Valley Launchbox, a lot of people uh, wanna know what that's all about. Well, if you go to Mr. Google and ask Mr. Google, they will give you all the information you need. But they do a lot of really cool things. First of all, they help the community um, with um, uh, micro loans, for instance. They help the community uh, as a business accelerator. Uh, they do a lot of really cool things to help young startups uh, get going uh, in the community. So it's a great community resource uh, for sure. Uh, we um, have two sponsors today. One is Chase, uh, Chase Bank, uh, probably a good place to keep your money. They love entrepreneurs as well. So it's probably somebody you want to talk to if you're getting started. And Adams Outdoor, Adams Outdoor help us uh, um, every year advertise uh, Startup Lehigh Valley. So with Startup Lehigh Valley, um, I want to introduce you now to the chancellor of the local college here of, um, of Penn State Lehigh Valley and Dr. Richardson, are you there? Let's go over to her. There she is. 
thank you. Thank you, Rich. I am delighted to be here um, tonight um, and pleased to be a part of Factory's second annual Startup Lehigh Valley Pitch Competition. It's especially great to be able to support entrepreneurs during the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that entrepreneurs see opportunity even in the most challenging times, and we are indeed in challenging times. Entrepreneurs are often, uh, more often than not, the visionaries, the risk takers, and the backbone of the entire workforce. And Penn State Lehigh Valley is excited to offer support through Lehigh Valley Launchbox, our entrepreneurial uh, initiative. Over the past five years, Lehigh Valley Launchbox has distributed 60 grants to over 54 uh, companies. And we have um, provided approximately $140,000 in, um, in grant money to start up businesses. We're proud to be the prize sponsor for tonight's event as well. You'll have an opportunity as the evening progresses to meet Kenneth Keat. Um, who you'll hear from because he is a great example of how we work to connect promising entrepreneurs to yeah, Penn to State's like, network of resources. It. As you'll hear from Kenny, um, he benefited in many ways, most especially from our free resources provided through our intellectual property law clinics. He received grant funding, mentoring, and um, had access to our co-working space and so much more. And you also hear from Matt uh, Bilski tonight because he was last year's um, startup Lehigh Valley uh, winner and a previous recipient of Launchbox uh, grant money as well. So I want to wish all of the contestants the best of luck tonight. I look forward to welcoming tonight's winners to the Lehigh Valley Launchbox family. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Rich, because I think everyone's eager to go. Yes, I would agree with you, Dr. Richardson. Thank you very much for those comments. And it looks like you're still at work tonight. I am still at work. You're that's, still at work. That's what um, entrepreneurs have to do. Right. Put in so, long hours. Right. You're still working for all those college students. So go, go Penn State. Um, all right, our three judges tonight. Annette, will you wave to everybody? Give everybody a little wave. Annette does business development for Penn State. So we're glad to have you here tonight. Matt, the winner from last year, uh, looks like he's in his office inventing something else. So, so uh, we wish Matt a lot of luck on whatever he's working on next. And Tony, he looks like he's retired. He looks like he's in South Florida or something, getting ready to play around a golf. So, um, so we welcome all three of our judges here today and thank you for um, taking the time out to uh, help us. Uh, we appreciate it a lot. So um, on the screen now, I think there's some judging criteria that's coming up that you can take a look at. And that's uh, kind of some of the things that the judges will be looking at. However, a lot of this is about how they present, right? It's about you know, how they you know, convince you this is right, how they clearly explain what they wanna do or not. So I think the judges will look at a lot about how they uh, talk. So um, uh, uh, now that we've got the three judges and we got the prizes, uh, we got the pitch stuff we've talked about. So now let's go get the first entrepreneur and start these pitches. So we got 10 of them. And so all 10 of them, we're going to go through. Each person's got two minutes to give their pitch. And then the judges have one minute in order to ask some questions. And we're going to move through this pretty quickly. So here we go. Hang on. Get your... Uh, Pipcorn, get your roar, and let's uh, make some fun here. So the first one we got up tonight is Ray. Ray is area pro. Uh, Ray is a professional window cleaner, and he's figured out a way to do his job better, bigger and better. And I think we got Ray coming up here in a second on the screen. So I can talk for about another few seconds, Ray, but you better get your picture on that screen so everybody can see you. So I'm sure they're working on getting Ray, but I saw his invention the other day, and it's pretty cool on what Ray's come up with, uh, with his little window cleaning uh, brush that he's developed. So, and he looks like a really, really good entrepreneur. If you'll just come up on the screen, we'll be good, Ray. Where's my Ray? All right, can we got Ray? All right, so, so uh, Ray is having technical difficulties. We'll circle back to Ray. Uh, uh, so we'll go to number two contestant. Number two is Clickify. 
Clickify is emit. So can we get to emit? Ah, there's emit. Yay, emit. Yay. Hey, I'm here. Good, good, good. Ready All to right. go. I like a man right. that's ready to go. All right, Amit, tell us about what you got. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. First of all, thank you, Richard, uh, and the factory team, along with Penn State University, for hosting this event. My name is Amit Parmar. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Clickify. I bring over 15 years of HR expertise in global Fortune 500 companies. Over the years, I saw a basic problem in our industry, which is how jobs get advertised to candidates and how candidates portray themselves to companies looking to hire. The recruiters rely on boring, text-heavy job descriptions, and candidates rely on wordy resumes. They've been around since the Roman Empire. Our research actually shows the attention spans of people is about six to eight seconds, and it's only getting shorter, which results in irrelevant applicants and recruiters missing out on great candidates. So at Clickify, we're disrupting how jobs get advertised and how candidates express their interest in the job. We're an AI-based software as a service that helps recruiters and candidates convert their job specs and resumes into visually engaging, stunning, visual social media content across LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, which is where a majority of candidates and recruiters hang out today. We went live about two months ago. We have six global customers in the US, UK, Australia, and Singapore. And uh, just some notable uh, hometown customers here include Air Products. The, behind me is an example of what Air Products is doing with their jobs and shift for payments. Early signs are positive. Uh, we've got a roughly 33% conversion rate of applicants with six to eight okay. X more engagement using our social cards. This is a $10 billion industry. And we intend to use the funds with the competition here that we win. 40% uh, of it will go into sales and marketing, 40% into product development, and the remaining 20% into filing a utility patent. Got it. With that, uh, I hope I'm at my two-minute mark. You got it. You got it. You got a couple seconds left, but a very good presentation, Matt. And I see that Air Product sign up there. So you really are working with Air Products, a local company here? Absolutely. I, I, I love it. Two local companies working together. We'll have to have you come by factory and we'll have to check out your uh, software because I hate reading those resumes. Those resumes are like, ah, after a couple of my eyes glaze, o glaze over and I, I just can't see it anymore. So sounds like you got a good product. Let's see what the judges have to say, though. Annette, what are you thinking about this? Yeah. Hey, Annette. Nice job. Thank you. Congrats on your success so far. So I'd like to hear what your customers are saying about your product. Yeah, uh, they, they love it. It's very easy. Uh, they're very busy. Uh, so these are recruiters mainly, right? So uh, saving a lot of time uh, as well as effort on their part around how they actually advertise their jobs across social channels. Uh, we're saving roughly 40 to 45 minutes per recruiter at the moment per job. All right, Matt, what do you, what do you have to say? So how does that 45 minutes of savings per recruiter per job translate into dollars in terms of, I know when we've posted on LinkedIn, it's been a pain to get good candidates back. How can you put some uh, quantifiable numbers to that? Yeah, yeah, great question. So we're uh, using our cards, uh, our, our customers right now are experiencing about six to eight X more relevant candidates, uh, just by the word virtue of simplifying the job description, as well as when the candidates are actually coming back to our clients. Uh, so uh, we're looking at roughly 30 to 35 percent conversion ratio of applicants to hires at the moment. OK, great. Tony, Excellent. how about how about you, Tony? What, what is your revenue model? and What will be your revenue in 2020? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. So we just went live about two months ago. Uh, we're a software as a service, so it costs roughly anywhere between eight to thirteen dollars per job posted, uh, uh, depending on the on the size uh, of the package that you choose. Yeah. Uh, and it's almost like Netflix. Uh, we're reducing the cost of advertisement from $200 to $400 on LinkedIn, as an example, down to $8 to $13. Okay. Great. And what's your revenue? Your, what uh, are at, you, at the what moment, your revenue this year? Yeah, so we just went live uh, two months ago, and our revenue at the moment is, is uh, very minimal because we're in a 30-day trial period with many of these customers. Okay, great. Thank you, Amit. Thank you for the information. Judges, thank you for your questions. Um, good luck, and we'll be talking to you hopefully soon. And thank you for being part of what we're doing here at Startup Lehigh Valley. Okay, now we're going to go back to Ray and see. There's Ray. All right, Ray, you made it. All right, we love you, man. I almost gave you pitch pitch for you, but now you're back. You can you can take over. All right, Ray, can you are you are you on mute? Are you set to go? Oh, you see your picture now. Yep, there we are. Okay, now you can hear me. You got me? 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Ray Valentine. I am founder and CEO. Well, I, I can't. I can't hear Ray. I don't know if the audience can hear Ray, but if I can't hear Ray, I'm assuming the audience can't hear Ray. Okay. Go right. All right. Go for it, Ray. They say they can hear you. Okay. Um, my name is Ray Valentine. I am founder and CEO of Area Pro. Um, I've been a professional window cleaner for about ten years now. Yeah, I can hear. In that time, Go Ray. And in that time, keep going, Ray. Okay. In that time. Um, I developed my own tools and uh, to make myself more efficient and help some of the er um, ergonomics uh, window cleaning. And I, and then about a year and a half ago, I started Area Pro, which is uh, the company in order to bring this product to market um, and trying to help window cleaners be better and be safer. So let me show you how we do that. So one of our products here is called the Ultimate Scrubber, and this is a handheld device. It has um, bronze wool pads that have come off and on. And this is basically to get non-water soluble debris off windows. And uh, we had a window cleaner from um, Philadelphia area who broke both of his wrists falling off the ladder a little while ago. He bought this. He loved it. He said it works great. And it really helps him because he has, still has pain in, on his wrists. So that's one product we have. Another product is called, uh, it's a bronze product. Again, so bronze wool is used in window cleaning to get um, stuff off glass you normally can't get off. This is the competitor's bronze. And you can see all the white fibers on there. It makes it less abrasive. We've done away with all those white fibers and it makes it more abrasive, less motions, more scrubbing power. And then we have this one coming out fairly shortly. This is a towel holder and basically it's like a keychain holder and it goes right to your belt. So you can use this to wipe down windows quick and easy. And the beautiful thing about these particular products is that we want to transition from not just serving window cleaners, but we can, we can transition into car detailing. We can transition into just general, uh, uh, cleaning and uh, even kitchen stuff. So if a, a chef can use this and have the rag on their belt, um, detailers can use this, all that kind of stuff. So what we're going to do is if we win this prize, we're going to take that money and put it into manufacturing and then whatever's left over will go into marketing. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for your pitch, uh, Ray. We really appreciate it. That looks like something I should be doing. Don't show that to my wife because she'll probably have me, you know, buying that stuff to clean the windows a little bit around the house. So I try to dodge she'll that. Get, she'll make you get to work. I'm going to get your number so you can come over and do that for me. Let's see okay, what the judges have good. to say. Annette, let's start with you. What what do you what question you have for Ray? Yeah, hey, Ray. So how are you reaching your target customers today? What are you doing for marketing? Um, so right now, most of our sales are coming from just social media interactions. So a lot of like organic social media stuff. Um, putting out videos, just talking on forums, um, and just being a part of, of the window cleaning community. We've run few ads, not very much, but um, 2021, we're really looking to amp that up and really drive um, ad sales. Great. Thank you. Uh, how about Tony? How about you? What question do you have for Ray? What, what are your sales to date? Um, we're doing about like 1300 a month. And that again, that's all organic. All right. No ads. All right, you better be careful. Tony might be an investor there. That looked like a pretty good number. Hey, yeah. Bring them on, bring them yeah. on. Is that, Matt, what are you thinking? What sets your tools apart from the competitors on the market? Um, again, with the bronze wool, there's um, there's really only one uh, main manufacturer in the States, and their wool is all pretty much the same. We have IP. We have a provisional patent on this particular design. We have um, another. We have uh, a design patent, and we have more on the way. And again, um, really, we're doing things kind of out of the box because I'm a window cleaner, and a lot of manufacturers have have been, you know, they started out as window cleaners and started their own company, and then now they've been away from the game for so long that they don't really have a gauge on what really is needed for this day and age. And we're kind of got that leading edge against most of the manufacturers out there. Okay, great. Thank you for those answers, Ray. We really appreciate it. We uh, hope you keep the windows at your house nice and sparkly clean, and we hope uh, lots no. of success uh, to what you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to number three, our contestant number three, JTJ Tech. Jonathan, I see Jonathan's with us. Are you here, Jonathan? Can you hear us? Are you here, Jonathan? Yes. Okay. I can hear you guys. Can you all guys right. hear me? Good. Yeah, Jonathan is uh, real-time monitoring for fire protection systems. So tell us all about what you got going on over there at your house. I, I'd love to do that. First of all, hey, everybody, Lehigh Valley. This is my people. This is my hometown. Okay. Um, fire sprinkler systems are designed to protect people, and pipe freeze can compromise these systems, putting lives in jeopardy and properties at risk. Discharge from pipe freeze can cost millions of dollars to clean up and restore, not to mention the productivity loss. Our device, the Salamander Reservoir, 
is designed to alert to and remedy conditions before pipe freeze can compromise your life safety fire sprinkler systems. I'm Jonathan Epstein, as Rich said, I'm a co-founder of JTJ Tech and a proud co-inventor of the patented Salamander Reservoir, the only device reading the internal temperature conditions within a wet sprinkler system. Salamanders were designed to alert to dangerously low temperatures in unoccupied areas, like sprinkler rooms and vacant or vulnerable spaces. Installation is easy and can be done by a licensed sprinkler professional in about 30 minutes. Until now, property owners and managers have had to combat pipe freeze based upon the variable air temperature. The weather's getting cold, better turn up the heat. No, no, no. Our device detects when your system's water temperature gets low and then notifies your owners, managers, or designated parties in real time via email and text. And it can also integrate with on-site heating to initialize heat at that point, saving significant energy dollars by heating only when the water gets cold. Our current business model is to sell one or more reservoirs and a controller gateway for a facility. The recurring revenue from the monitoring of that gateway makes our venture unique and compelling for investment. Additionally, in many cases, the cost to install and monitor salamander reservoirs is an expense that can fully be reimbursed back to the landlord as a common area maintenance expense, just like the shared cost of parking lot lighting and snow removal. Tenants pay pennies for the many benefits of our salamander reservoirs, life safety, asset protection, energy savings, and a lowered risk of building occupancy. We're ready to scale throughout our target market, which is sprinklered in commercial buildings, essentially north of the Mason Dixon okay. line. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, hold that salamander up there. You kept flashing around. We can't really see it. Yeah, see that salamander? Turn it around a little bit, model it a little bit. So it's got a, is that, is that a real live one or is that just a prototype? That's a real live one. This what? is certified, tested, and all set to go, ready for installation. All right, well, be sure that salamander doesn't bite you while you're holding it. Be careful. Let's go to the judges. Judges, all right, Tony, let's start with you this time. What, what's your question, Tony? How do you get to market? We've been getting to market directly by talking to end users. For example, we're talking to landlords of commercial buildings. The um, big rates we've been we've been having some success with uh, with commercial landlords who are managing properties remote to them. Um, so we've been going direct. We're also talking with sprinkler installers about locations, um, as well as municipalities and um, first responders. Uh, about problematic locations that may be a good fit for our device. Great, thank you. How many do you have to sell to get to a million dollars of revenue? Say it again? How many do you have to sell to get to a million dollars of revenue? I, I wish I had an answer for that off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know for certain right now. It's just say, just say a lot, just say a lot, a lot of a them. A lot. A lot, a lot of them. All right, so Annette. I count your building and then whichever ones are left. Annette, how about you? Yeah, hey, Jonathan. So what's been the biggest objection from customers and how do you overcome that? Right now, quite honestly, the biggest objection is really budgetary, budgetary right now because everything on the commercial, um, in, in the commercial real estate marketplace is a little bit sideways with COVID and, and tenants looking for rental deferments and, and trying to get their own businesses straight. So I would say it's, it's really time budget COVID. Okay. We That's had great, great momentum at the beginning of the year, but that really went sideways great. when COVID hit. So great. we're seeing, you know, we're seeing just a great, setback. In great question, Ed. Great question. Matt? Why do you think other major industry players like the one in Easton haven't developed technology like this? That's an interesting question. We get it a lot. Being a commercial landlord, there's, there's kind of a, a, a different world that we're in, which is, Places like to install and then they leave. And so the landlord gets hold, gets left holding this bag of responsibility. And it's the landlord that takes that risk of making sure that their vacant areas stay heated. Okay. So that's why we're okay. going after landlords directly. No okay. one else seems to be addressing it. If it was, we wouldn't be in business. Great question. All right. Well, thank you very much for all that. You're very knowledgeable of your product. It looks like you're doing something uh, that's very helpful to the commercial real estate industry. Uh, good luck, and uh, we'll see where you end up in all of this. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, guys. All right, thanks. All right, now we're going to our next contestant. Um, we go going to uh, Nick um, Protestium. Nick has got a B2B company that automates crowd management through an AI platform. Uh, you look like a AI platform kind of guy, so Nick, take it away. Tell us what you're doing over there. 
Hey, thank you all so much for having me on. Um, you know, really, we've all experienced difficulties of getting groceries during a pandemic, really even just getting outside of the house. Our number one concern in this climate is consumers is safety. And for businesses, it's really getting fined or shut down for not being able to follow safety regulations. So like many middle market businesses, grocery stores have a plethora of IDC-based camera systems with untapped potential already in place. We give these businesses the tools they need to manage their crowds autonomously by tapping into these live feeds and monitoring crowd flow as people move through buildings. Business owners can now focus more heavily on doing good business rather than managing people. I'm Nick Yarnell, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Potestium. We're developing a cloud-based pl crowd management platform that allows businesses to manage crowds in seconds using hardware that they already have. And clients will feel safe knowing that we don't actually record any uniquely identifiable data. We simply provide actionable insights to what's going on right now. Our platform is so adaptable that within minutes, we are able to adjust for COVID-19 and have since pilot tested with Temple University, a few buildings there, and the Bucks County Planning Commission. What really sets us apart is that we have the ability to inform both employees and customers in real time of their safest and most efficient way through a building, room, or even a venue. And we do this by sending text notifications or integrating with mobile applications or on-site digital displays. Current hardware solutions really take way too long to adopt and implement, whereas Potestium is not intrusive and takes seconds to host an unlimited number of surveillance systems. By quarter one of next year, we're gearing up to launch a robust platform that transcends industry borders to help businesses in the Lehigh Valley navigate through COVID and realize a new level of safety and efficiency as things move back to normal. Thank you. Okay, Nick, thank you for that. Uh, sounds like you've got a lot of really good work in front of you and this software, this AI platform, and obviously it's really needed in this marketplace is to you know, help with crowd controls of what's going on. I local supermarket the other day, they started counting people again. Um, so they should start counting toilet paper on the shelf, which is zero, but they're counting people going in the front door. So good luck. Now let's turn it over to the judges. Matt, let's start with you this time. So what sets your technology apart from the other AI companies using IP camera data to do things? Uh, really, it just comes down to the focus of those companies. Uh, we see a lot of competitors out there on the market that are really focused on security as, as their way of tapping into these IP-based cameras. Um, now, we've seen some companies that focus on uh, counterterrorism, and I've seen we're really the only company out there completely focused on crowd management, not just with counting people, but helping businesses do better business. Great, great question, Matt. All right, Annette. Sure. So... I'm going to ask you a broad question. Why should we invest in you over some of the other candidates today? And how are you going to use this money if you win? Sure. I mean, it, it, COVID-19 really changed everything that we were doing with this company. Uh, we were originally stationed in the ski industry and have since you know, been forced to take a few steps back and really reevaluate where our crowd management technology shines. And that's in helping businesses get back on their feet, helping them, uh, you know, essential businesses start serving their customers again um, and helping businesses, you know, really reopen and do it in a safe and timely manner. And we believe we can do that um, by quarter one of this next coming year. Uh, we plan to launch our platform uh, with universities being top of mind, helping them reopen and getting their students and staff back to school in a safe manner. Great. Great question, Ned. All right, Tony, for the last question on Nick. Nick, I don't quite understand what your software does. Uh, I heard the word cameras, and then I, I, I think I heard the word count. So I'm presuming that your software counts the number of people in a given location. But I don't, I don't get anything more than that. Yeah, I, and you're on the right track, absolutely. Uh, basically, what we do is we tap into the security systems. Uh, then we host that live footage in the cloud and place artificial intelligence overlays on top of the live footage so that we can provide analytics in real time to the companies that need it. And then on top of that, not only do, do we do the actual analysis, um, we consolidate the information in a way that it's understandable for our clients to read and act upon in a timely fashion. 
Okay. All right. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much for that answer. We appreciate it. Good luck with your AI software and counting of all these people. So hope to talk Thank to you, you soon. All. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. All right. So let's go to um, our next contestant. Our next contestant is MGS Products. Tracy, there she is. Hey, Tracy, how are you doing today? Good, thank you. So Tracy's doing uh, oral swabs used to mitigate the physical effects of tube feeding, and she's got a lot of uh, experience in that area. So tell us more about... Go. Sure. So there are over half a million tube-fed patients in the United States alone, both children and adults. A tube-fed patient is someone who gets all their nutritional needs from either a PIC line or a G-tube that's typically inserted into their stomach. How does that impact a, a tubey as they're called? Well, they can't taste, smell, or swallow, or enjoy their food, and they're also not producing saliva. Saliva is what helps di the digestion process. The Betty isn't about the actual swab. The Betty is about the chemical and the, the ratio between the flavor and the glycerin that creates moisture in someone's mouth so that it A, gives the person who's too fed the taste and smell of, the, of food that they're potentially eating, but also creates a certain level of salivation in their mouth to help with the digestion process. There are hundreds of research studies around the world that prove that taste and smell has a significant impact on the quality of life for those patients who are intubated or tube fed every year. Um, and so that's what the Betty does to mitigate that situation. Um, I work with dozens of tubies and we, we did a survey in, in preparation for, um, for this product and 100% of the patients said that a product like the Betty would significantly improve their eating experience, just as the studies internationally um, tell us. Um, and additionally, these, these patients, they're obsessed with the Food Network because they don't get to taste and smell their food. So they need to touch it and they need to feel it and they, and they want to be a part of it because they can't taste it. So the Betty would mitigate that whole situation and dramatically improve their experience. Okay, thank you very much for that two minute pitch. We appreciate it. Now let's go to the judges and see what the judges have to say about your Betty. All right, from Betty to Annette. Okay, Tracy, seems like a great product. So what's the biggest barrier you're facing to launching this business? I think the biggest barrier is trying to find a chem lab or a food lab that will help us with the um, the actual ratio that we need for the flavor and the salivation. It can't be too much salivation um, because we don't want the patients to to choke or anything. So it's that it's that sweet spot. And it's finding that lab that will that will work with us to find that perfect ratio. Good. Thank you. Tony. How are you planning to sell your product? The product would be sold vis-a-vis -vis institutions um, to nursing homes, rehab centers, hospitals, etc. cetera. Um, they would be sold in units of one because you only need one, sw one swab to swab the mouth. Um, sometimes patients right now, they get swabs that are in packs of threes and stuff, and they just throw the other two away. But these would be sold to institutions. The other thing is most tubies are also um, fed at home. So once they figure out how the tube feeding works, you know, the pick lines and the G-tubes, they're sent home and they could be on a tube feeding for years and years. My mother-in-law, to which this product was, was invented, she was on a tube feeding for five years. Wow. So it could also be sold to the consumer directly in, you know, mass quantities of swabs to keep their mouths moistened and and Great. flavored. Great question. Great question. Matt, let's finish up with this one and keep her moving. What does the regulatory landscape look like for a product like this? It's a great question, Matt. It's considered a non-medical medical product, which means that um, it's used in the medical community because it is used to mitigate the effects of tube feeding, but it's not considered any product that needs to have FDA clearance. So it, it allows for a widespread um, opportunity and not the years and years of research that would or 
um, that would be required to, to go through the experimental experimental process. Great. Well, thank you. I, I do have one question myself. What is the most popular flavor of the Betty? Well, we've done some research and one of we're looking at the top flavors in the world and one of those is coffee. People want their morning coffee. Wow, and that's an interesting. Another one is chicken pot pie. <laughs> interesting. Um, and then burritos are a real common flavor burritos. in the world. So. All right. Well, that's interesting. Thank you very much. We wish you the best of luck. Thank um, you. And uh, you're doing something that uh, is very good for the medical community. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to our next contestant, um, Carbon. Carbon, Justin. Let's see if Justin's there with Carbon. The Environmental and Social Impact Scorecard uh, to connect consumers and businesses together. All right, well, tell us what you're up to over there, Justin. Great, yeah, thanks for the intro. Uh, so Justin from Carbon here, really excited and honored to share a mission with you today. So first of all, I wouldn't be here without my team. Um, shout out to Derek, my co-founder, Sid Del Sid, our Chief Sustainability Officer. Uh, so we have two Temple Owls and a Penn State Nittany Lion and over 25 years combined industry experience. So what is Carbon? Uh, Carbon is the environmental and social impact scorecard to connect consumers with businesses that are actually making a positive impact. And the problem we're solving really on the macro level is fighting back against climate change. So industry experts say we have less than 10 years to reverse the effects of what we've already uh, done to our planet. And on a micro level, how can we change that? So consumers really care about the environmental impact of businesses they support, and they really want to uh, support businesses that are making a positive impact. But right now, they just don't know how. Why? Uh, because there's greenwashing, there's lack of transparency, or there's just no information at all about that, the impact of that business. So what we're doing is providing a simple scorecard for consumers to provide clear, transparent information about the positive impact of that business. And on the business side, we're actually providing an impact toolkit to easily increase their impact. And this is where we generate our revenue. So uh, we're generating revenue from clean energy supply, sustainable supply chain options, such as compo compostable packaging and composting services to uh, reduce the amount of waste that goes into a landfill. Uh, and this is all done on a sustainable marketplace and we collect a brokerage fee for connecting the businesses to these services. And the average revenue is about $1,100 per year. Uh, the first business we onboarded, we ended up saving them $16,000 over two years while generating $2,400 in revenue to carbon, all that zero out-of-pocket costs to the business, which is really important during this time. So. Uh, we envision carbon to be synonymous with the likes of just Google it or take an Uber. Uh, what's your carbon score? So thank you for your time. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. I, I'm going to have to go home and check my carbon score before I go to bed tonight and see how I'm doing. So uh, thank you very much. It's uh, very interesting. And obviously that's something that is obviously the whole society's uh, kind of moving to to figure out how we all can do better in all these areas in the environment. So uh, Matt, why don't you take that one first? What do you think the big steps are for your company to go from a noun to a verb? From a noun to a verb? Your goal was to become like Google it. Sure, so yeah. For you to become that big, what do you have to do? Sure, yeah. So that's a, that's a, that's a great question because in the ESG space right now, uh, there's, there's a, not a lot of action. It's a lot of measuring the impact, but there's not a lot of action. Uh, so what we're doing is we're actually incentivizing business owners to take action by increasing their score uh, and we're providing the services to to increase that score while reducing the negative impact potentially reducing their cost uh, and enhancing revenue opportunities to connect with more consumers okay great, great. Um, tony as a business owner with people in buildings I'm struggling to understand why what your product is other than just, as you say, it's a scorecard. Do I do an inventory of, of and it tells me what my, my carbon intensity is, what total score, is that what it is? Yeah, so great question. So we identify four major impact themes, which are in line with the global sustainability standards that uh, Sid, Sid put together, um, similar to companies like B Corp and, and Bloomberg, where uh, they have ESG metrics. So yes, we first step is to measure uh, based on the, the the uh, guidelines that we created. And then the second step is to do the in-person audit to verify the information that they provided is correct. And the last step is to provide recommendations on how to um, either reduce that impact or um, cost saving opportunities there. So if I had an office with 200 people, what would be my potential savings, if any? 
So that's, that's a good question because, because right now we're targeting more of the small to medium sized business owners uh, and the potential savings on the energy side um, alone, really with the, the, the first business owner that we signed up, um, it was about a 30% reduction on their energy costs. And that was mainly so, just through the energy supply. So that's your principal saving here is energy? For right now, it's the energy supply. Uh, we will be incorporating some energy efficiency, uh, some, some IoT products that, that identify some more cost savings in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, Annette. Yeah, so what are you gonna do to create some momentum around awareness of your energy score since there are other energy scoring metrics out there? Yeah, so what, what we plan to do is really bring in the consumer side to ramp up the impact. Uh, so uh, the way we're doing that right now is mainly through um, you know digital, social media, marketing. Uh, with the um, uh, in-person, we're gonna have some QR codes where you can scan to, to see what the carbon score is of that business to, to create that awareness. Because right now, 83% of consumers care about the impact, the same amount uh, research a business before deciding to buy from there. So there's a lot of consumers actively looking for this information. It's just not centralized, and we're, we're looking to centralize that. Great. And that it almost we like going to New York City and see the restaurants with an A, B, or C, right? Um, so you go to see some type of carbon score for that small business. It could be interesting if you can get some traction uh, to get consumers to go into that business because they have a good carbon score. So That's our goal. Great idea. Um, I love the entrepreneurs out there. Always thinking of something interesting to move forward. So thank you very much, Justin. Appreciate thank it. You. All right, so let's go to our next contestant. We're on number seven now, only a few more to go. Uh, Skillion. Um, it's the Internet of Things for Tech Startup featuring Connected Dashboard. And we've got Pete here with us today. I think Pete came all the way from Australia just to come over to show us Yanks how to make something happen. So, Pete, <laughs> tell us what's going on. Hey, thanks. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, very pleased to be here. Came from Sydney, Australia. I uh, was invited by Ben Franklin to come over. But this is my home. We're doing work with Lehigh University and other businesses in the area. I love it here. But our product and really our mission is to connect e-mobility. So e-mobility devices are e-bikes and e-scooters and e-mobility. And this is really growing uh, really very rapidly now here in the United States. What do we do specifically is we take something like the Tesla computer out of the e electric car. We make it smaller, we make it um, a better and more suited to the e-mobility market. And our product here is the Connect Dashboard, which we're now currently shipping to our first customer. So a little bit about how big this opportunity is, especially here in the United States. With the pandemic, people have moved to buying bikes and bikes can't be born, bought in some places. And electric bikes especially are really booming here. They've been doing great in Europe and other, overseas, but really here in the United States, they've really started to take off. But what is the problem? Well, safety, the number one reason people don't ride these things is because of safety. Number two, security. Two million bikes are stolen every year. Three, it's, it's a little bit like New York taxi and it should be like an Uber. And four, there's a really a lack of data in, around and on the bike. So we have a system which is not just the connected dashboard, but a back-end fleet management system to tie all this together. One customer we have out of India wants helmet detection. We use AI to detect helmets and alert them to that, and that helps them with their li liability. We have another customer looking at 10,000 units here in the United States that wants this technology to turn their electric bike into a smart bike. And our third customer uh, is delivering to Amazon 35,000 units, they want to address the last mile delivery problems. Wow, sounds like, sounds like you've got a lot going on there uh, yes. <laughs> to, make, to make those e-bikes work and the mobility. But, um, so it's kind of like having a Google dashboard right in front of you as you're riding around. That's that is, exactly that, right. That is, that is awesome. All right, let's go to the judges and see what the judges think about what's going on here. Uh, Matt, you're kind of an inventor. So, I mean, you tell me, is he doing something good or what's your question? So... In the, the you have the the e-bike companies and all that you have the birds the the scooter companies and you have people building bikes where are you in this ecosystem and who actually is the customer buying things from you so companies that build bikes distribute bikes uh, are our customers but we also have fleet managers so these are people that are out there actually uh, with fleets right now 
Oh, interesting. Okay. Tony, you got a question? Yeah, I understand the explosion in the in the bikes and electric bikes. Uh, if I had an electric bike, what would be, I, what would I buy from you at what cost? Uh, we're not direct to consumer yet. Uh, we're very focused on B2B. But one day we expect to be with a later version of this connected dashboard, which you would buy off the shelf. You would plug it in, you would, you would cable it up, and it would provide you with all those kinds of services. So you would get uh, a mapping function. You would get um, uh, a rear camera, which tells you when something's coming up behind. And really, we've got a roadmap of about 60 applications, which would all come into this, which I think some of them you'd really so like. What's your add on cost to the manufacturer? Um, our cost, is, well, our cost profile is a lot to do with volumes, but we are shipping them now at $250 a piece, and that's basically our cost in prototype form. But as volumes go up, you know, scale kicks in, and we expect to be able to get under $100 in costs and still be able to ship so them. So it, it would cost me $100 to get your navigation services if I had an electric bike? No, $250. Right, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Annette? Yeah, so Pete, as you think about your target customer, what's the problem that you're solving for them? So that, there's really four problems. I, I briefly touched on them. One of them is getting people out on bikes because they don't feel safe. And we have a, an AI tool to help them see what's coming up behind them and also record. There is a product out there in the market. Ours is certainly better than that. Uh, it's a radar system by, by, by Garmin. Uh, security is the other one. Because this is an AIT, oh, IoT device connected to the bike, it provides an element of security to the bike. Um, and the other ones were operations and user experience. Again, it's having um, a complete suite of tools in front of you, not on your phone, because your phone's in your pocket, you need two hands to ride a bike. It gives you the services and the connection that is currently not existing. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. Here's an Aussie trying to break into the U.S. market. So he's got a pretty interesting uh, piece of technology if he can figure out how to get the consumer uh, to use it. So congratulations, and uh, we wish you the best. Thank All right. So let's move on here to number eight, our number eight contestant, Lyceum Institute. Uh, we got Sean. The Lyceum Institute is an online educational service company that uh, supports Asian families. So tell us more. Tell us more, Sean, what's going on there? Sure, thanks so much. Imagine arriving in a new country that spoke a different language and lived a different way of life. How would you know how your new community was judging you? How would you make connections to support your growth? How would you succeed in school? I'm Sean Berger, the found up and startup CEO of the Lyceum Institute, a private educational services company that provides international families with the most effective solutions to overcoming cultural barriers that interfere with thriving in American schools. Even though all our students achieve Ivy League results, our tutoring, test prep, and admissions consulting services are more than a means to an end. We begin with a personality assessment to ensure that the way we present intellectual content aligns with the bigger picture values that motivate each student, then provide students with easy to understand analyses of their strengths and weaknesses, and then advise them on processes to think better. Our referral and retention rates are high because our methods yield results beyond the assignments themselves, allowing our students to enter American classrooms, celebrating their native cultures alongside their new one. While 70% of our business is Asian, we've served families from every continent except Antarctica. Our competitive pricing allows us to secure the best tutors and make a great upside. Our year-to-date 2020 revenue is $45,000 higher than our 2019 revenue. The Lehigh Valley has over 20 colleges and hundreds of secondary schools. 30% of Penn State's student body matches audiences we serve. If we win, we'll invest the grant money to market better, enhance intellectual property, go business to business with schools, which will allow Lyceum to prepare more students to add value to companies like the ones in this competition, as well as across the world. Great. Well, that is that is great information. And guess what? You've got you've got uh, Penn State Lehigh Valley right here tonight. Uh, you're the chancellor's on. You've got the business development director over here. So I mean, you're just like we're connecting even before we even finish the contest. So Thank let's you. start with Annette. Sure. Hi, Sean. Hi. So. 
What do you think makes you different and unique from the other competitors in this space? For sure, actually a lot of stuff, but I'd say the main points is most companies, like most people, assume that thinking is an accidental process and they don't teach students better ways to think through school concepts. Likewise, they're completely neglectful of the cultural differences between each culture that are external forces that affect students' academic performance. We're the exact opposite and we have strategies and approaches to make sure that um, the student thrives in this culture without giving up their native one. Okay, great. All right, Tony. I, I like a lot of what you're saying, but it sounds like your product is extremely manpower intensive to deliver. So, um, yeah, it definitely takes uh, a good brain and good training and a, and a real interest in um, education. But um, we invest a lot in paying our tutors. We're able to bring on tutors who already have a foundational set of values that align with ours. And then we put them through about 15 hours of preliminary training. And we're, we're long-term coaching our tutors, but they gain independence with time. So like some of our tutors that have been working for us for a year, um, it's, they flow really independently and smoothly. Good, good question. How many customers and tutors do you have right now? Um, well, I usually go by hours because some stu students do more than one hour a week or are in packages. But right now we're doing 45 hours a week of um, consulting and tutoring. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Matt. So building on um, the earlier two questions, how do you see this scaling from the equivalent of basically one person an hour a week to a million person hours a week to become a venture scale business? Yeah, so um, through strategic alliances and going business to business with schools, um, schools themselves don't prioritize um, managing the cultural transition of incoming students on, the, on a level that's deep enough to secure a solution to that cultural barrier. Um, and even when the schools want to, it's just difficult, right? Like a school, schools have a lot of things going on and that's not always so one of the main things. Is the, uh, is the customer the school then or the parent? Currently, the no, but long-term, I think to grow and like serve way more students than we're doing, that we would have to one, become more visible to families that approach us directly and then to also become a part of the way in which schools operate and have them refer to and rely on us for our service to help with their international student population. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. It sounds like you're doing something really good for students that want to you know, mix in with the culture. So good job for being an entrepreneur and finding these ways to be helpful. So we wish you, you the best of luck. All right, we'll go to number nine, our number nine contestant. Um, Verde Mathis, Mantis, like the little, like the bug, right? Right, the Mantis, is that the world's easiest to use 3D printer. Wes is like, he's been working on this. You can see it over his shoulder. I can see it right there. Uh, so tell us more about what you're doing over there, Wes. What's going on, Rich? Yeah, my name is Wesley Hart. And I'm with Verde Mantis. We're the manufacturers of the world's easiest to use 3D printer. Uh, you can see this little guy behind me. And, and I think that's a pretty important place to start to anybody it's kind of new to 3D printers is that traditionally there's a pretty steep learning curve involved. A lot of software, a lot of tweaking of a machine And our company started from the ground up to build a product by selecting hardware and software that actually removes a lot of those challenging steps and can get a new user working on their 3D printer in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, this isn't just kind of something that we kind of feel in our gut. It's based on the last 10 years or so of industry experience and working with some of the most popular options that are out there and seeing where they fell short and where they worked well. Um, a lot of affordable printers, a lot of good quality printers, but not any on the market that really are focused on making it easy for somebody to get involved and get up and running as soon as, uh, as they come into the fold. Uh, there's two steps involved with our system. It's select a file and press print. 
And that has been really the, the biggest change compared to some of the competitors. Uh, in the last year, we've been selling to the marketplace. Uh, this year to date, we've sold over 50 printers, which is a big milestone for us. And we're at a point now where our manufacturing is in a good position where we have a good feel for our earliest customers and we're ready to fold some marketing dollars in. And that's why this competition was pretty exciting for us is it gave us a chance to engage with different people, um, you know, broaden the audience, but more importantly, it gives us a chance to engage with people who can help scale businesses. Right. And as a closing thought, what something that really excites us is just how young and how quickly growing this industry is. And we'd like to be a part of that, but beyond just us, we think it's an opportunity for Pennsylvania as a whole to reclaim that position as a manufacturing powerhouse. Great. Um, well, we like any interesting questions. We like we like manufacturing Pennsylvania as a powerhouse. Those are great words. You're going to have to be a politician if this doesn't work, Wes. All right. So let's go, let's go to our judges. Uh, Tony, let's, uh, let's start with you. What are you thinking? What is the price, what is the price of your product? Uh, the retail price is $9.99. We actually have an upcoming Kickstarter, though. So if you're looking to save a couple dollars and you're interested in the printer, check out our Kickstarter. We have early bird pricing. And anybody who's just interested, check out our website because you can order one right now. But there's some new features if you're interested in the Kickstarter. Thank you. All right, Thank let's you. go to Annette. I know. Yeah, so what are your customers saying about your product? What do they uh -huh. tell you, the good and the bad? I'll start with the good. The good is that, I mean, we're really having people, like we had somebody show it to their mother who had never used a printer before, and they explained to her kind of the basic steps, and she was up and running. And uh, we have, a, there's a repository of files that are like very useful, and she had selected something for her own use in her house and got up and going very quickly. I think if there was something bad that I had to focus on is that we had an alpha tester group and a beta tester group. And I think it was really important because we were able to refine our product, but we found that although our software was intuitive, there was a couple bugs that we had missed in our first group of alpha testers. And so they were <laughs> thankfully very honest with us and we were able to pinpoint those, flesh them out. And by the time we got to our beta testers, the, uh, the feedback was much, much better. And at this point, we're excited. We're shipping product out across the country. Great. Good job. California. Good job. Let's go to let's go to Matt. Matt, you're the you know the technical engineer here, so you probably have a really good question. So sure, I do a lot of 3D printing. The FDM process inherently, which is this type of printing, fails a lot. So I understand that you're making it so I can drag a file and it just prints. But like on the printers I have here in my house, I have recipes that also just print. What are your success and failure rates like popping out materials, basically? Are your prints themselves coming out more reliably than other printers? Yeah, the short answer is yes, um, but there's a good reason. And it's because we put some hardware in place. Like we don't get too technical with new users, but the steps that are being automated are when you press print, so to speak, on the back end, there's a file that's being uploaded to the printer and it has two computers on board. So it handles a lot of this on its own and it just goes through to uh, repair, slice, orient the file. It brings things up to temp temperature, but most importantly, we actually have a sensor that every single print is going to measure the build plate in its exact position in space. And to your question about, you know, sometimes they fail. A lot of times it's because a printer is drifting out of fine tuning. And a lot of people don't know how to tune a printer well. So by having this advanced sensor on board that's accounting for any drift in print setup on the hardware, we're getting a lot better results consistently. And we recommend to our customers one really high quality filament. And some will use others, but by keeping a uh, very low variability in the filament itself and by always checking the actual real world physical location of that print bed, we're getting much better results and people are happy with that. Okay. That sounds like a really good technical question. You're getting too technical for me. Uh, I think Thank what you, you should much. just do is loan Matt one of these printers, and then if it works, he's going to be a big fan of yours, right? We and love and, and or if somebody's looking for a thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollar Christmas gift, this could be a hell of a Christmas gift for a thousand bucks. There you Check go. Out the web, guys. I'm picking. I'm picking. I'm helping you out there, Wes. All right, we got one more tonight. Our right. last one before we um, go to break. This is a. Uh, Wood Goods Lacrosse. Uh, we got Justin. Justin is a new and better wooden lacrosse stick. All right, Justin, tell us what the heck's going on with lacrosse sticks tonight. Awesome, thanks so much. So lacrosse sticks break a lot. Players often buy three sticks at a time, and the challenge is to create a durable stick that will also flex. 
Manufacturers refuse to use anything but the cheapest carbon to produce sticks, and increasingly demanding weight requirements lead to thinner and weaker shafts. However, by sourcing our wood from the same trade secret location as Louisville Slugger, and an improved manufacturing process that improves consistency and strength through computer-guided CNC mills, we were not only able to create the highest quality wooden shaft on the market, we're able to create a product that flexes like carbon, is far stronger, and is only one ounce heavier. Because of this hole in the market for a durable, affordable carbon alternative, we made over $27,000 in our first 12 weekends traveling to tournaments. Our average sale is $70.49, and by investing in our own industrial production facility, we're able to get the cost down to just $2.11 per unit, which is an incredible profit margin, but this is also while working in ramp up scaling with three employees who are able to produce over 350 sticks per day. Um, there are dozens of tournaments every weekend during the summer and fall, so I invested in custom tents to expand to two locations at once. And while this is great for growing the brand image and doing outreach, I eventually realized that I was only addressing less than 1% of my target market by traveling to tournaments, even though that they were generating more than $3,000 per event. This is simply indicative of how well we could do if we address the whole market. We recently launched our website, which we can market through targeted social media ads, working with influencers and AdWords, allowing for unlimited outreach and scaling. We eliminated all of our wood shaft competitors in the in-person sales market in under a year through a far superior product. And I believe that we can do the same in the online market through improved website functionality and superior branding. My wood shaft competitors could also not figure out how to produce at scale domestically. And thus there has been a huge hole in the retail space for a wood shaft for some time. Until now, we have our products on consignment in our first retail store with a strong likelihood for a larger order next year. And with your help, we can, we can, I know that we can soon scale to be in the largest sporting retailers across the country. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Well, you, you win the contest just for being at two minutes exactly. You must have a clock in front of you. So great, great job there. Um, yeah, I, I'm thinking that probably Penn State's going to want to talk to you about moving over from Lehigh to Penn State. Maybe they can draft you. Maybe they got some lacrosse program that, you know, Penn State can. I don't, I don't can, think so. You don't <laughs> think so. All right. You're pretty solid. All right. Annette, we'll start with you. All right, Justin. Sorry we can't convince you to come to Penn State, but so what's the biggest challenge that you're facing to scale your business up bigger? So the biggest challenge that we are facing is actually getting into the retail stores. Um, a lot of these um, big locations like Lacrosse Limited, like Dick's Sporting Goods, are weary to take on someone of my age. But since we've gotten in other stores, our products have performed pretty well. And the fact that we're in small location proves our performance. Okay. All right. Tony, what are, what are you thinking? I'm thinking that you devised a stick that doesn't break as compared to others. And what other sports would this be applicable to? The best comparison would be baseball. So what we're trying to do is become the Louisville slugger of baseball. Um, what Louisville Slugger does is they source their type four French grid quality ash the same way we do. And they were able to create a brand and an image around the product that's scaled and that performed. Um, the, a bad comparison would be to hockey where wood sticks are compared to be um, of lower quality. Um, and lacrosse is the opposite. Lacrosse, they're, they're known as a durable, um, affordable item. Okay. All right, Matt. So first of all, you should check out Modell's. I think they're a Lehigh family. But on to technical question, why haven't the big brands of lacrosse sticks followed the same suit with going to wood instead of composite? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, it first comes down to a couple different things. Firstly, it's the type of wood. No one's actually figured out where this type of wood is that grows so dense. It has a much better strength to weight ratio than any other products that we have um, have been on the market. Um, another problem is that it's hard to scale. And what we've done is we've actually figured out a manufacturing process that we um, kind of keep a secret. And it allows us to not only produce our sticks more affordably, it allows us to make them stronger. It allows them to make them a lot more consistent in terms of a product. So we're able to deliver a very consistent product to our retailers, to our customers um, that other people cannot. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Best of luck with your lacrosse and and, um, you know, we, uh, we wish you the best. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, all right. Now, good job, all contestants. I think we got them all, right? We got all 10 of them in. All right. So, so now we're going to go vote. But before we go vote, I want to thank the judges again uh, for the good work, the judges. 
and the judges probably can't see it, but your name's up there, who you are, where your company is, and what you're doing is on the screen so everybody can see uh, who you are and what's going on. So again, we have Annette with Penn State. We have Tony. Uh, Tony is with Computer Aid Business and Technology Services. And we got Matt, which is an entrepreneur and, and owns his own uh, little business there. And, and uh, we should get an update from you at some point, um, uh, Matt, about how you're doing. But uh, we'll circle back on that later. But we appreciate all the good help from the uh, judges. We appreciate uh, the time that you give tonight. And as you can see, all the judges are uh, and their names and their businesses and, and, and so forth are on the screen so everybody can uh, see those. Uh, judges, while you go into deliberation, we're going to have up on the screen a URL um, that uh, the audience can go now vote at this URL. So I don't see it. on the, I see it on the bottom of my screen now. So if the audience will go to that URL, you're able to vote live. And uh, we'll bring up your results from the audience in a minute. But meanwhile, the three judges will uh, get, the, get together and figure out who the winners are. And they'll be getting back with Dr. Richardson shortly. Uh, during this kind of three to five minutes while the judges are, are um, thinking about this, we've got a couple of videos we want to show you. So do not go away. Watch these videos. They're good videos. And then move uh, with the results. Let's show the videos. This recession is the worst that any of us have seen in our lives. Just gotta think the world is on fire. There is plenty of money in venture. My name is Kenneth Key. I'm CEO and founder of Power Performance. I want to welcome you all to Startup Lehigh Valley. I'm a Penn State alumni class of 2019 and also a LaunchBox, a two-time LaunchBox grant recipient. My journey started at Penn State uh, as a business student there. And my, one of my mentors, Professor Krasna, had motivated me to apply for a pitch competition. After winning that event, it gave me the confidence to pursue my journey in entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm a first time entrepreneur in my family. So this was something that was outside of my comfort zone and Penn State really gave me the resources that I needed to be able to follow my hopes and dreams. Myself and some of the fellow students, we began to brainstorm um, ideas and how to build a company from scratch. Um, that was when I was awarded the grant money uh, for Launchbox. And one of the biggest impacts in the success of my business today was the resources from the law clinic. I mean, I feel like to date, I've probably used in a, in a dollar amount around anywhere from $150,000 worth of legal assistance for free. And uh, I mean, I, I give that up to Penn State. Uh, I know in my case, we started off um, completely different from where we are today. And I was only from learning the customer and learning exactly what they wanted and not what we thought they wanted. So uh, where you start and where you end up could be totally different, but that only means that you've done your research and you've created a product based off the needs of the marketplace. And good luck to all the entrepreneurs participating. I'm Dr. Matt Bilski, founder and CEO of Flex Solutions, where we're solving real world problems with cutting edge robotics. Flex Solutions competed in the 2019 factory pitch night right after we founded the company to commercialize the FlexBot using our novel snake-like robot called the FlexBot. The story of the FlexBot begins when I was at Lehigh University doing my PhD. Originally, I had this vision of running wires through walls without a mess. But over time, I realized that there are so many problems out there where workers need to get places, but they can't easily get there or can't get there safely. Over the summer, we've had a successful pre-seed fundraise and are currently building out the team to bring the FlexBot to market. It's great to see that the LaunchBox organization is offering things from complimentary legal services to these mastermind programs. So a key piece of advice to everybody here is even though this is virtual, try to do your best to meet somebody you haven't met before and really connect because it's those little connections you make today that seem to have unintended but great consequences in the future. I hope you're all staying safe and well and hope to see you in person next year once this is all over. Best of luck to all the teams competing tonight and I look forward to hearing more about your ideas. 
All right, here we are. It's my understanding that we're still all working. Is that the first, second, and third place awards? The judges are still working hard to figure out who the winner is. So it must be close. It must be really close. So now I, I think we're going to put up the audience uh, winner. So uh, let's see if the audience winner, see how the audience voted. There it is. Okay, you see it up there on the slide now. You can see on the winner. Whoa, looky there, 200 votes. Somehow I think the Lehigh, Lehigh, Lehigh University must have voted for Wood Goods is a lacrosse player is the audience favorite. Can you believe that? Look, I mean, 202 votes are still voting for the guy. Oh my gosh. You must have threatened everybody with the lacrosse trick if they didn't vote for you. Wow, congratulations. That's a $1,000 uh, audience prize. So we don't know. You, you might have won something else here um, more, uh, Justin. So we'll have to stand by and see. But put that um, slide back up. I want to see that slide again. Put that slide back up on um, where Justin had 200 I'm overwhelmed votes. overwhelmed by the support. It does help that. Yeah. Um, How many people do you have in your family? You have 200 people in your family? I, I have the Lehigh University connection. So I put this on my Instagram story. I've been wow. All of my fraternity brothers to call around and tell everyone they know. Well, to you're, gonna, you're gonna owe an awful lot of beers. You're gonna owe an awful lot of beers. Somebody you're gonna have to buy a lot of beers to, Justin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, congratulations to that. Uh, so we we're really uh, proud to have you as part of the uh, startup Lehigh Valley. Even though if you're even though you're over at Lehigh University, well, we still love you, man. Uh, Penn State <laughs> Lehigh Valley's uh, doing a great job on putting this together. I think we're getting, we're getting closer. closer to uh, getting our uh, first winners. But while we're standing here, I'll just tell you a little bit more about uh, Factory and what we do over at Factory. People ask me all the time what we, over, we do over at Factory in South Bethlehem. Uh, we took one of the old um, Bethlehem steel buildings uh, that's uh, you know built in the 1940s and we converted it to an innovation scale-up center for small businesses. Um, we like to invest in businesses that are three to five million, 10 million uh, dollars, and then help them grow up to be bigger uh, brands, if you will. So uh, we do that. We have about uh, 45, 45 to 50 people that work for us at Factory. And uh, we do one thing that's a little different. Uh, we're not venture capital and we're not um, private equity. We're operators with capital. And so what we do is when we do find the company we want to invest in, uh, the company actually uh, has to move to Bethlehem. It's kind of like you get a scholarship to Lehigh or you get a scholarship to um, uh, Penn State. You kind of got to go there. And so if you take money from factory, you got to kind of move to Bethlehem and work out of the uh, building there on South uh, Bethlehem. So it's pretty cool. And if you're during normal times, we invite everybody to come by and take a look at it. And a lot of people have been by. Obviously, during COVID, we have to put up a hand and say, not right now, but going forward is that when things get better, uh, we look forward to having the community in. We do a lot of community events in the building as well. But we'd like to help these young entrepreneurs grow up sooner, faster, less mistakes, and uh, get them into the marketplace. So that's kind of what we do over there at Factory. And uh, we certainly um, uh, are fortunate to be here in the Lehigh Valley. And one of the things we do with the entrepreneurs is that we, we like to help and give back to the community like we're doing here tonight. So we appreciate all your support. So let's check with the judges. Are we ready? Judges, thumbs up. We got a thumbs up. All right. We see thumbs up. All right. So let's go to Dr. Richardson and have Dr. Richardson give us the winners. Have you got the information? All right. All right. So I am excited to report the outcome of our, our competition. Um, I'm going to start with the third prize uh, winner first and build up to uh, first place. Um, the third prize winner is a, a 15 uh, receives a $1,500 um, uh, boost to their business, um, and that uh, company is Verdi Mantis LP. Oh. All right, let's give a virtual clap. Come on, let's get a virtual clap going on there. Yeah, Verdi Mantis. All right, good job. So that brings us to second place, which is a $2,500 um, boost to your business. Um, and that winner is JTJ Tech. All right. That's the, that's the pump, man. That's the water pump guy. All right. <laughs> Great job. I'm going to get one of those for my house. Can it? <laughs> 
And so the the, the virtual drum roll um, for the first prize winner uh, goes to, uh, and that's a thirty five hundred dollar um, um, prize. That goes to Wood Goods Lacrosse. Wood Goods, he won both. He won the audience award. He, oh my gosh, we all have to buy a lot of lacrosse sticks now. <laughs> Let's let's ask him. Let's ask him if he'll make lacrosse sticks with with uh, with a Penn State logo on there. We will. I will I, I'll have to at this point. I'm, <laughs> well, good for I'm you. I'm overwhelmed. Well, Thank good. you so much for having me and giving this amazing opportunity. Well, Dr. Richardson. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, congratulations to our first, second, and third place winners. But we have three more uh, awards that we'd like to um, to announce. So those additional awards are for um, are, are classified as boost awards for five hundred dollars each. Um, the the first award goes to Area Pro. All right, so area. Congratulations, Area Pro. Great. Um, the next prize uh, for $500 goes to, uh, um, now I'm going to pronounce this wrong, uh, Cleef uh, Cleefify. <laughs> Clickify, um, Clickify. 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 Thank you. Clickify. Fly. Uh, and that's for $500, the Boost Award. And then um, uh, Carbon, Carbon is the third Great. Um, award. So, All right. Congratulations to all of our winters, winners. It is um, a great um, opportunity to support your entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, welcome to the, the factory and Penn State Lehigh Valley uh, entrepreneurship uh, you know, programs. We, we support you, we applaud your hard work, and uh, we wanna be there, Penn State Lehigh Valley Launchbox to support you every step along the way. So Good. congratulations. Good. Well, let's give them all a virtual clap, everybody. Let's give them a virtual clap for all the winners. We really appreciate the hard work for everybody. So thank you, Dr. Richardson. Thank you for the good words. Thank you for Penn State, Lehigh Valley, LaunchBox. Um, you I, I also just want to say um, uh, thank you very much to all of our judges, Tony Savaggio, uh, our last year's win winner for the, for, um, for uh, Lehigh Valley Startup, and then of course to the director of LaunchBox, um, who has been uh, very instrumental in making sure that we're able to provide these resources to the community. So thank you and congratulations, everyone. Good, well, thank you, Dr. Richardson. We appreciate your support uh, at the college uh, to help make all this happen. And uh, we, again, I'll say thank you to the judges, Annette, Tony, and Matt, and all your information's up on the screen so everybody's watching, sees who you are, your companies. They have everything up there but your phone number. So I figured we'd leave your phone number off. So, um, so, so uh, the thing that we want to do is, uh, again, thank you for all the participants, uh, the 10 finalists. Without, without the participants, we wouldn't have any event. I also want to tell everybody, this is the first time we're doing this virtually, right? So we're learning too. We're entrepreneurs tonight trying to figure out how to do this live online with all the judges over here and Dr. Richardson over there, I'm over here, and all the contestants over there. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of switching. So uh, we thank you, uh, all the people, uh, Clark Media, that uh, helped us do this as well, uh, Penn State, Lehigh Valley, LaunchBox, we appreciate all your support, Chase Bank, uh, we appreciate all your support as well, Adams Outdoors. We appreciate your uh, support as well. Um, we will be doing this next year, and hopefully next year we'll be doing it in the factory building, uh, as we did on the first year. Um, but who knows where we'll be uh, with all of this. So all we can say is uh, we, we hope for the best, and we hope that everybody stays well, um, stays safe, uh, and going forward. And uh, we look forward to uh, even doing it bigger and better next year. We'll have a little under our belt this year, so next year we expect to do it bigger and better. And again, thank you all the participants. Thank you, Penn State, uh, Lehigh LaunchBox. We really appreciate all your support there. Thank you, judges. We appreciate that. And contestants, most of all, thank you all the contestants. Have a good night. Stay safe. And we'll all see you soon. Thanks.